I would like to start by introducing you to someone. His name is Carl Benz, and the year of the picture is 1886. I know he looks very serious, but that's just how they took pictures back then. <laughs> I'm sure he was extremely happy. After all, he had just invented the first car, and unknowingly, he had given birth to one of mankind's biggest industries, the automobile industry. A lot has happened since then. By 1950s, more than half of American households owned a car. By 1960s, the number was already 80%, and it has stayed above 90% since then. In less than a century, almost everyone in the developed world had access to a car. And yet, the story is about so much more than cold adoption figures. We developed an emotional attachment with cars. Cars became an important part of our lives. I don't know about you, but as I was growing up and approaching 18, I became obsessed with getting my first car, with one car in particular, a blue Golf GTI. <laughs> Boy, I love that car. I remember I would skip university classes, just to go around, drive it around, going nowhere, listening to music and enjoying the feeling. And yeah, I know I know I might be a bit, a bit crazy, but I also know that a lot of people experience something similar. How did that happen? How did we become obsessed with machine? If you look back at history, you realize that over time, we built this complex and beautiful narrative around cars. We provided them with strong meanings and allowed them to define our own personalities. Cars, cars meant freedom. They meant virility, adventure, status. Cars promised to take you anywhere. They even became the staple of entire generations. While obviously exaggerated, um, that story was mostly true for a long time. But it also became unsustainable. As the world population grew, as we concentrated in ever-growing cities, the system clocked. It just stopped working. At some point, we lost perspective. We devoted our entire cities to cars. Have you ever considered the amount of space that we've given up in favor of cars? In cities, nowadays, it's over 30% of the surface of cities. Being trapped in traffic no longer means freedom to a lot of us. We've not, also, not only devoted our cities, but our health to cars. Cars have become the single most polluting agent inside of the cities. Last January, Madrid hit all-time records in, in terms of pollution levels. And if you know the city, you probably know the sky shouldn't be brown. It should be a beautiful bright blue. And while we devote our cities and our health, and even our skies to cars. We do that at a hefty economic expense. Cars are households' second biggest purchase, right after housing. In a country like Spain, we spend close to 10% of our annual GDP on cars. <coughs> and yet, cars are absurdly underused. According to McKinsey, only 2.7% of the time, cars are effectively moving people from point A to point B. The rest of the time, they are parked, trapped in traffic, or moving around trying to find a place to park. And the problem is not only inside of the city. If you consider all the trips that we do between 100 and 800 kilometers in Europe, 76% of them are done by car. And yet, the average occupancy rate is 1.7 people. As I said before, I think we lost perspective. Cars were invented with five seats because they were meant to transport families. They were meant to be shared. And we turned them into these complex and costly machines that we used to move a single individual every once in a while from point A to point B. To me, this does not make sense anymore. <coughs> By now, uh, you probably think I hate cars and I want them to disappear. <laughs> On the contrary, 
I'm still the same guy that fell in love with his first car, and I still love cars. In fact, I'm extremely excited because three innovations are coming together to put the entire industry upside down and change how we relate with cars. I'm talking about the sharing economy, electric cars and autonomous driving. Over the last five years, we've seen the explosion of the sharing economy. For the first time in history, we have the means and the technology to trust and collaborate with each other massively. And that is changing everything. I've been lucky enough to be a part of it. I work at Blablacar, which is Europe's biggest sharing economy player, and the world leader in mid- and long-distance carpooling. What we do is we connect drivers that are traveling somewhere and have empty seats in the cars with passengers that want to do the same trip and are willing to contribute to the cost. By doing that, we immediately unlock a massive transport network, and we, use, we do a much more efficient and sustainable use of the car and it's been growing exponentially. Nowadays, 12 million people travel using Blablacar in 22 different countries. To put this in context, a company like British Airways transports 10 million people per quarter. And while Blablacar is having a very deep impact in mid and long distance, a growing number of companies is dis are disrupting how we move around in the cities. Car sharing, ride hailing companies, they're shifting the paradigm from property to access. Soon, owning a private car to move around Madrid will just not make sense. Secondly, as technology innovation accelerates, the traditional constraints to electric car adoption are disappearing. On the one hand, we've always had convenience-related barriers, such as range or, or recharge time. But batteries, which are the, the, the cost of those two magnitudes, are exponentially growing their capacity. Nowadays, we have Tesla models with over 400 kilometers of autonomy that can get up to 270 kilometers in just a 30-minute recharge. Soon, recharging will take as much time as refueling. And on the other hand, we have costs. Running costs for electric cars is already lower than the traditional equivalent. And in the next five years, several companies have announced models that will have a price tag that is as affordable or even cheaper than their fossil fuel equivalent. That's when the liftoff will happen. By 2040, 35% of the global car sales is predicted to be electric. And the figure will be much higher in regions like U US, Europe, or China, where it will be the majority. Lastly, we need to consider how we drive. Over time, we focused on making cars safer. But despite our efforts, according to the World Health Organization, even today, 1.25 million people die every year in ro road traffic. In fact, it is the number one cause of death for people 15 to 29 globally. Truth is, we tried, we've tried to solve the problem by introducing incremental innovations that attempted to patch a faulty part of the car the human at the wheel. We like to think we're very good at driving, but we really suck at it. <laughs> we are humans. We hate repetitive tasks. We get bored. We get distracted. We drink. We text. We do everything we shouldn't do while driving. Thankfully, we're good at one thing, at innovating. We've heard a lot about uh, artificial intelligence today, and artificial intelligence is about to take over the driver's seat. By 2050, it is predicted that Artif um, autonomous will be the primary mode of transportation, reducing road kills by 90%. But of course, a lot more will change with autonomous driving. The whole concept, design, and culture around cars will be disrupted. Even one step beyond, autonomous driving will close the loop with the sharing economy. What will happen when, while you are at URBC at work, your car is driving people around, making money for you? How will the industry look like when cars pay for themselves? There's, of course, a lot of uncertainty around the future of cars. But one thing I'm sure of, we are day one of a new normal. What cars were for the last 130 years is no longer what they will be. We will change the entire value chain. We will shift the focus from refineries and petrol stations to recharge stations and batteries, from mechanical engineers to software engineers, 
we will create entire new industries around this new concept of car. Now, I don't have kids yet, but I will someday, I hope. And I know I will be telling them about my first car, about that blue Golf GTI and how much I loved it. I know I will be emotional. I know I will be pouring my heart out, telling them how I almost cried the day I sold the car. And yet, I'm pretty sure they will be looking back at me with a funny look in their faces, unable to understand, just as if I was telling them about this. <laughs> Thank you.